Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Paris Schutz. Coming up on the program, an impeachment 101 on the eve of the expected vote in Congress. An update to a story WTTW first reported about a CTA bus driver fired for hitting and running over a cyclist. And a book about the rise of Uber and the fall of its mercurial CEO. But first, a victory this afternoon for supporters of efforts to delay recreational marijuana sales in Chicago until next summer. This is despite the fact that weed becomes legal statewide on January 1st. The measure to keep it from being sold in Chicago until July is spearheaded by the Aldermanic Black Caucus. It passed City Council's Contract Equity and Oversight Committee today by a vote of 10 to 9. It now goes before the full City Council tomorrow. And joining us is 28th Ward Alderman Jason Irvin, chairman of the City Council's Black Caucus. We also invited Mayor Lori Lightfoot's office to send a representative for tonight, but nobody was available. Alderman Irvin, we thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. And a quick reminder, why are you pushing this measure to delay the sale of recreational marijuana in Chicago until July? The real challenge is that there's not any equity amongst the 11 people that will start the sales effective January 1st. The 11 dispensaries in the city of Chicago, none of which have any African American, Latino or female related ownership. And that's a problem for many people in our city. And there are going to be more than 11 when this rolls out January 1st. No, there are actually only 11 in the city of Chicago. But they, they get an extra permit uh, to, to open a new store. Even though they do that, they still have to go through the regulatory hurdles. So those stores probably won't be open until sometime later this year, if not next year. Okay. Okay, so you've been negotiating this uh, with the mayor's office for a while. Today, just late this afternoon, she issued a statement saying, quote, I have repeatedly asked the members of the Black Caucus to devise a strategy that addresses equity. Instead, we have primarily been met with a litany of complaints, but no tangible solutions. Crossing our arms and walking away is a tactic, not a strategy, and it is not only unacceptable, but irresponsible. Is there a strategy or just crossing your arms and walking away? No, we're not crossing our arms and walking away. We've been very clear from day one. Uh, we believe that there should be equity uh, for minorities in the 11 dispensaries that exist. So this has not been a tactic. This has not been uh, anything that we have just said, you know, crossed our arms to. We've been actively talking with them, actively talking with the state about what can be done to ensure equity from day one, not waiting for the six months for the, uh, the, uh, social equity applicants to be able to just get an opportunity for a license. Again, day one, people will be making money. In the first couple of days in Michigan, they had $2 million worth of sales. That's probably something that'll be multiplied here in Chicago. And for us to have not any ownership in that is just not right. Like you said, the 11 medical marijuana dispensaries will have licenses for recreational weed. What is the strategy to get some kind of minority representation within those owners? Again, uh, actually just today, we, we received a telephone call from one of those 11 miraculously talking about, hey, what is it that we can do to help change, change your mind, change your opinion? Our position has been the same from day one. We would like to see ownership vertical integration in the 11 dispensaries that exist and that will start doing business effective January 1st. Okay, so your delay ordinance did pass the committee today, 10 to 9. Do you expect you have the votes to pass it in the full city council tomorrow? Uh, we, we have what we feel is necessary to get you know, to pass, pass the votes on tomorrow. So otherwise, we would not have uh, started down this path. Again, uh, we, we fully expect to be able to deliver on what we started. And Mayor Lightfoot is saying she's just not going to go along with this. There are parliamentary maneuvers that she and some of her allies in city council could use. Do you anticipate that two aldermen will vote to defer this vote as they can under parliamentary rules? Uh, I truly hope that they would not do that because in, in effect that what they're telling everyone is that equity does not matter. It means that we should allow the status quo to continue delaying the vote on what we're proposing would do exactly just that. So if, if aldermen want to say that equity doesn't matter in the city of Chicago, if that's the message that the Chicago City Council wants to send to everyone, then someone will, will work to do that. The mayor's also signaled she could veto the ordinance if it passes, which is something that rarely ever happens in Chicago. Do you think she'll do that? I, you know what, I can't speak to what the mayor may do. Uh, that's within her prerogative to do. She has the authority under the state constitution to do such, and if she does that, we'll have to deal with that if that happens. Do you anticipate further negotiations in the next 12 to 16 hours before this vote is taken? I mean, again, uh, we're always open uh, to, a, to a conversation. However, the one key thing, I think, is that principals uh, need to be involved in these conversations. We've heard from a lot of people's staffs, but we have not heard from the principals and the architects of everything that happens here between the city of Chicago and the state of so Illinois. So that means the mayor and the governor. That is correct. And again, we have not heard directly from those individuals on what their, what their plans are, what they can do to help 
change the landscape of equity for the 11 dispensaries that will start effective January 1st. You've heard from the state's cannabis czar, uh, former state senator Toy Hutchinson. She says that delaying this was going to do more harm than good, especially for social equity applicants in the future. To whom? Your response? It, 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 to whom? I mean, again, we're talking about a, a, a multi-million dollar business is going to kick off effective January 1st without the participation of those that have been most impacted by the war on drugs. Again, we're talking about social equity, we're talking about peanuts that they're offering uh, social equity applicants if they're so lucky to be one of the 75 out of possibly two or 3,000 applications that are going to come in. There's so many holes and so many games that are being played as relates to these applications in equity. And again, we want to see what this actually looks like. Social equity may look different to different people, but if you're taking an opportunity where you can consider hiring individuals versus people actually being from in communities that are impacted, that, that can have a very different lens of what it looks like once it's all said and done. And you kind of alluded to this. Uh, in May, there will be 75 new licenses available across the state. And what you're saying is you're not convinced that uh, minority applicants could get a, a fair share of those? Well, let me just, let's go back into history. Uh, we were promised with the Illinois lottery that we were going to see great changes in education and education funding. And here we are still today fighting those same battles from back in the 70s when the lottery was presented. So again, I want to see what social equity truly looks like before allowing any additional licensees to operate in the city of Chicago. I think it's only fair to our citizenry and I think it's only fair to everyone that's involved. And if social equity means what you and I think it should mean, then that should not be a problem. You know, the way this law is designed, it was designed by the state. So is this too late? Why not uh, lobby state lawmakers and the governor several months ago when this bill was being crafted? Again, during that particular uh, point in time, this bill literally just came, almost came out of nowhere. I mean, they had been talking about the bill, doing things about the bill, but again, it was a, you know, 600 plus page bill that came down and was voted on in a matter of hours. So again, it, it, these are some things that you hope to, uh, would have been worked out by the legislature, but again, they took all of the ability from the city of Chicago to do things normally we would do, such as licensing, such as regulations. All of that power has been stripped from cities across the state and our home rule ab ability has be been preempted. And that's, and that's a challenge. So the only tools that they gave us was to either be in or be out. So as it stands right now, based on what I see, I would prefer to be out. You did say earlier today there are some positive steps here with the mayor, even though you are moving forward with this delay ordinance. What are those positive steps? I mean, they, they've talked, she's talked about the, uh, the cultivation center, and I think these are all great things in putting our city money behind social equity applicants. And that means that a city-owned cultivation city center? City-owned cultivation center, because at the end of the day, Everyone, I get two or three calls a day from people asking, how can I be in? How can, what can I do to be part of this? This will be the biggest financial change and potentially wealth generating uh, activity that will be sanctioned by the state in a number of years. The last, again, was, was, was Riverboat Gaming. And I only know of two African-Americans I'm familiar with that ever got any real money out of those deals. And so this is something that should have the ability to help more than just a very small select group of people, which is what it is doing right now. Is, is there a solution here before tomorrow short of one of these 11 current owners um, saying uh, to a minority applicant, hey, why don't you come on and be a co-owner no, with me? I, can't, I, can't, I won't foreclose on any anything right now. Again, uh, we are we have always been in this for the equity of our community. And if solutions come forward that are about creating additional equity for the African-American, Latino and female owners, we're open to that and have always been. And they're saying there's a, a pot of money from this revenue that will go to social equity applicants. You're not worried that um, um, that you're going to limit that amount of money. I'm not worried about that. It, quite frankly, it's something my father would call chump change. A again, you know, we're talking about millions, millions of dollars, and you're talking about offering a couple of million dollars to a, a select group of people that may make it. Again, I think the city is, is well healed in its intentions, and I think that we have the ability through our many programs, neighborhood uh, opportunity funds, TIF funds, and other funds to help qualify social equity applicants in the city of Chicago, get up, get going, and be successful. Very quick, so you're saying you want a, a pledge of public money to some social equity applicants from the city? Again, we are, we've always, we proposed that from the, even from the beginning, that we should be supporting social equity applicants that are Chicago citizens, the born and bred here in our city. We should be supporting them with the full weight of our government. Alderman Jason Irvin, thank you very much. We'll thank watch you for having tomorrow me. to see what happens. Very well. And up next, the state's new rules on using timeout rooms in schools and the problems some parents and educators say they're causing. This evening's presentation of Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by North Shore University Health System. 
Here's to the end of illness and the beginning of how healthcare should be. At North Shore, we're transforming your healthcare by analyzing your DNA to identify future health risks for you and working to stop illness before it begins. When you're a North Shore patient, your advanced primary care physician makes the latest genetic science part of your everyday care to keep you healthier longer. Advanced primary care. Here's to taking control of your health and taking on what's next. The Illinois State Board of Education is in the process of rewriting rules for timeouts and physical restraints for school children across the state. This comes after a report last month revealed tens of thousands of cases of children being placed in locked seclusion, often without any safety reasons. After the report, the state moved to ban locked isolation rooms, but since then some schools and families say the state has made a knee-jerk reaction that's affecting their children and students. Brandis Friedman has more on this. Brandis, what are they saying? So Paris, they're saying basically that they need these rooms, that some of them have students, children who um, have special needs, and that they need to be able to access these seclusion rooms in order to calm down in a safe space. For example, one mom that we spoke with says her 18-year-old son, Joey, has severe autism. He's nonverbal, he's not potty trained, and he travels almost an hour and a half one way from home in Fox Lake to his school in Lyle because that's how much the family values the care that he gets at that school. Now these are some home videos from mom Suzanne Mitchell. She took these of Joey since she was concerned that having her camera crew in the room or nearby to film him might upset him. Mitchell says that when he does get upset, Joey can't verbalize what's wrong. Maybe it's a stomach ache or a loud sound, which is why he wears sound blocking headphones, but he can become aggressive and she says he needs a space to himself. I have gymnastics mats in his bedroom that are also up for him to be able to bang on and and get it out. That's what he craves. That's his sensory issue when he's upset. He needs to bang and he elbows and he kicks and he does all kinds of things. I am a bit of a mama bear and if there was anything about this that was dangerous to my child, you can guarantee there is no way anyone would have ever been allowed to do it. And for that reason, Mitchell says she trusts her son's school, Giant Steps in Lyle, to use those timeout spaces when necessary. We went to Giant Steps where they have several timeout spaces for students to use. They were previously called isolated timeout rooms until this recent change. Now, while we couldn't get video of one, they're about 10 by 15 feet and about eight and a half feet high. There's a large rectangular window for staff to keep an eye on the student inside and a security mirror in the corner to be able to see all angles of the room. The staff at the school says those rooms have been extremely useful when needed, but it's only useful for about 15% of the students at Giant Steps. All of the students there are on the autism spectrum. They say the state's new rules requiring an adult to be in the room with the students are making it a bit more difficult. Which is challenging and a little confusing for some of our students. We have, for many of them, taught them that once we're in this space, then they can have that space to themselves and they can have privacy and they can access their calming routine, their coping strategies, other things that we, again, have taught them the skills to utilize in those environments. And now we're saying you can do all of those things except for someone's gonna stay in here with you. And so it does create some unsafe situations in which a student might continue to be physically aggressive towards the adult in their room. Brandis, when the Tribune and ProPublica broke this story about isolation rooms, there was a lot of concern, a lot of controversy. The state moved quickly to ban timeouts or isolated timeouts. So what have they done since then? Right. So at the time, the state filed those temporary emergency rules uh, that banned the use of such locked timeout rooms. Uh, those emergency rules will expire in April. Meanwhile, the public comment period is still open for the proposed permanent rules. Under them, timeouts can only occur when there is a clear safety threat and other methods have been tried, not as a form of punishment. The door must remain unlocked and a trained adult must be with the student. The rules also ban the use of supine restraints. That's a physical restraint, except in emergency situations. And some folks that I spoke with say even the physical restraints are not preferred. The rules also clarify requirements for annual training and parent notification after any use of timeout or restraint where the timeout rooms or the isolation spaces were used for punishment, and that is completely inappropriate. I can certainly understand where a child emotionally just needs a quiet space to be able to come down and de-escalation strategies to be used with that child, but to simply put a child in a timeout situation because they're not following a rule or they're not complying immediately with a request. 
And state school superintendent Carmen Ayala there going on to say that that is completely inappropriate. And the state association representing special education administrators says while the Chicago Tribune ProPublica report clearly highlighted some gross misuse and overuse of timeout rooms, some schools, he says, are in a tough position because they do work with kids that have a high level of need in a time where they say special education staff and resources are strapped. Illinois Alliance of Administrators of Special Education President Kevin Rubenstein says the organization is working with members to address those problems, but also to advocate for what students and staff need in Paris. In addition to the new rules, there is legislation in both houses of the General Assembly uh, that would ban isolation rooms. And today, uh, the Senate and the House announced that they will host a joint hearing on these seclusion rooms in early January here in Chicago. All right, Brenna, certainly a more complex issue than first thought. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Thanks. Very complex. Two Illinois Democrats who had been holding off say they've reached a decision on impeachment a day before the House vote. Amanda Vinicky has that story and more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Amanda. Paris, two members of Illinois' congressional delegation expecting tough re-election battles say they will vote to impeach President Donald Trump tomorrow. Dan Lipinski, a moderate Democrat, released a statement saying, I've always strived to vote in the best interest of my constituents and the country, which is why I sometimes deviate from the party line. But in this case, he's sticking with party leadership. Lipinski says based on evidence, it's reasonable to infer the president abused his power in the Ukraine matter. First-term Congresswoman Lauren Underwood spoke about her views on the House floor in Washington. The president has demonstrated a pattern of corrupt behavior and abused his power for his own personal political gain when he pressured foreign leaders to conduct investigations against political rivals, jeopardizing our country's national security and the integrity of our elections. Underwood, Underwood, that is, going on to say she will also vote in favor of the articles of impeachment. Federal investigators are apparently eyeing another major player in Illinois politics, former Cook County Assessor Joe Berrios. The Chicago Sun-Times reports a federal grand jury has subpoenaed Berrios and several of his political organizations, seeking information on official actions taken in exchange for benefits like property valuations and reviews. Berrios lost a re-election battle last year to current assessor Fritz Kagey. After that, Berrios stepped down as chair of the Cook County Democratic Party. Chicago-based energy company ComEd and its parent Exelon also under federal investigation. And now Exelon's facing a class action lawsuit because of it. A complaint filed on behalf of shareholders alleges the corporation misled investors by not disclosing that its employees were engaged in illegal lobbying. A spokeswoman for Exelon says the corporation does not comment on pending litigation. The Chicago Police Department's following the recommendation of a research firm and reorganizing its detective divisions. One thing that's really important about uh, folks that live in high crime areas is, uh, and one thing that I've come to know over the long time I've been a cop, is that they want to know who their police are. You know, they want to have a relationship because they're very likely to see them regularly. And, and when you see somebody regularly and you know that, that uh, you'll see them tomorrow and the day after, you know, you, you tend to have much more faith in them. Interim Police Superintendent Charles Beck says basing more detectives in the west and northwest sides of the city will also increase response times. He says that could help improve the CPD's low rate for solving serious crime cases. As for the weather, a slight chance of snow tonight, then cloudy and windy with a low around 13. Tomorrow, sunny with a high near 21 degrees, but watch out. The wind chill will make it feel as cold as one below. And now, Paris, back to you. All right, Amanda, can't wait. Still to come on Chicago tonight, the House votes tomorrow on articles of impeachment against President Trump. So what will his trial in the Senate look like? A CTA bus driver who struck and ran over a cyclist earlier this year racked up hundreds of hours of overtime pay. How a gung-ho corporate culture and legally questionable tactics spurred rideshare company Uber to dominance. A vintage toy collection inspires a group of Chicago artists, but they're not just any artists. We tell you why. And we take a deep dive into an emerging literary genre called climate fiction. But first, some of today's top business headlines from Cranes. Here's editor Ann Dwyer. Thanks, Paris. Cranes has learned that the parent of Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Illinois is cutting dozens of employees from its staff. 
Healthcare Service Corporation is making the move less than six months after its previous CEO left the company, a departure that was followed by the exit of a handful of other high-level employees. A spokesman for the Chicago-based health insurer tells Cranes that the latest wave of cuts affected a few dozen middle management positions. The company, which operates Blue Cross plans in Illinois and four other states, has more than 23,000 employees. Meanwhile, the real estate developer that brought Google, McDonald's, and Mondelez to the Fulton Market neighborhood is set to build another office tower in the trendy West Loop area. Sterling Bay has filed plans with the city to build a 14-story office building at the corner of Carroll and Racine. That's in addition to two other ongoing office projects for the company in the 300 block of North Green Street. The Carroll Avenue building would be the 10th office property in the Fulton Market neighborhood for Sterling Bay. And finally, Foxconn received a warning from a top aide of Wisconsin's new governor, Tony Evers. The Associated Press reports the governor's office is telling Foxconn that its scaled-down factory in Mount Pleasant won't qualify for tax credits unless it renegotiates its deal with the state. The Chinese computer equipment maker previously won $4.5 billion in taxpayer subsidies under then-Governor Scott Walker to build a manufacturing plant in Wisconsin. For Crane Chicago Business and ChicagoBusiness.com, I'm Ann DeWire. Back to you, Paris. Thanks, Ann. The U.S. House is expected to vote to impeach President Donald Trump tomorrow. Then what? What will the trial look like in the Senate? Here to explain the next steps of impeachment is David Franklin, who teaches constitutional law at DePaul University's College of Law. He also clerked for Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg in 1999-2000. He served as State of Illinois Solicitor General. Welcome back to Chicago Tonight. Good to be here. Thanks. So the vote is expected to go down along party lines tomorrow. Do articles of impeachment uh, act as sort of a grand jury indictment? That's right. That's it. They're going to be the basis for the trial in the Senate, which will unfold soon. And so there's a trial in the Senate. Who become the prosecutors for this trial? Well, the House designates uh, a set of managers. It's usually a handful of members of Congress from the House, presumably all Democrats, although there is some talk about independent Justin Amash being a member of that crew. Uh, and then the president will have his own defense counsel, um, aided by uh, the White House Counsel's Office. And to be clear, the rules aren't the same as, as a regular criminal trial or a legal trial. What are the rules? Well, a lot of the rules are up in the air. Now, the Senate does have uh, rules for impeachment. They've been on the books ever since the impeachment of Andrew Johnson in 1868. Uh, but they leave um, a, a lot of discretion uh, on the part of the Senate. And what's most peculiar about an impeachment is that the hundred members of the Senate act as a jury, but they really also act as the judge. Yes, Chief Justice John Roberts will be there to preside, uh, but almost any decision that he makes um, can be overruled by a simple majority of 51 senators. So it's a simple majority that's going to sort of set the basic rules here. One of the things being debated is who will be the witnesses. Senator Chuck Schumer, the minority leader, says we want John Bolton, we want Mick Balvaney. Senator Mitch McConnell says, nope, not going to get them. Who wins that battle? That's going to be an issue that's uh, up for a vote. And the politics of the moment are going to decide that issue. Can the Republicans who have 53 members in the Senate hold their caucus together? Uh, or will there be enough defections, at least on the question of, we want to hear more facts. We want to hear from certain witnesses, maybe not hear from others. Um, and, you know, Mitch McConnell runs the Senate with an iron hand, but I don't know whether he'll be able to keep his caucus together on each and every issue of, for example, who testifies. And so it's just a simple majority on all those issues. That's right. If, if the Senate wants to change any of those rules that have been around since 1868, that they would have to do by a 67 vote uh, majority. Uh, but most of the issues that they're going to be dealing with day to day can be decided and will be decided by a simple majority of the Senate. And senators have to take an oath to be jurors here. It reads, quote, I solemnly swear or affirm that in all things appertaining to the trial of the impeachment of Donald J. Trump now pending, I will do impartial justice according to the Constitution and laws. So help me God. You have very uh, prominent members, Senator Lindsey Graham, Mitch McConnell saying they will not be impartial jurors. They've already made up their mind to acquit. Mitch McConnell saying he is going going to work closely with White House counsel. Do these kinds of statements violate 
the senator's oaths. Yeah, they've violated their oath before they've even taken it, which is, of course, uh, disappointing and, and discouraging, but that's the way things seem to work in Washington. Is there some sort of recourse for that? No. Uh, the Supreme Court has been very clear that the Senate has the sole power to try impeachments. And what that means is that the Senate can decide how an impeachment is tried. It's a so-called political question, meaning that courts can't get involved. Could the Senate also vote to dismiss the entire case? They could. Uh, there was an attempt to do that during the Clinton impeachment 21 years ago. Uh, uh, that would likely be, again, a, a simple majority vote. Uh, and so the question there would be, you know, maybe after the opening statements are concluded, if one of the members of the Senate moves to dismiss the entire trial, uh, would uh, 51 votes be there to do that, or would there be a majority to at least let the facts play out? You mentioned uh, Senator, I'm sorry, um, Supreme Court Justice, Chief Justice John Roberts presides over this. What do you think his um, demeanor, temperament, strategy will be in this case? Because he's not a traditional judge here. Well, you know, his mentor and former boss, uh, Chief Justice William Rehnquist, presided over the Clinton impeachment. Uh, and he liked to quote a lyric from his favorite Gilbert and Sullivan to the effect that he did nothing in particular and did it very well. Uh, I think John Roberts is going to aim to take that same kind of hands-off approach this time around. And, you, you know, the president today sent an angry letter to Speaker Pelosi. The consistent message here with the White House and, um, and Republicans has been to frame this impeachment process as unconstitutional or a hoax or a coup. Do you see that sort of message resonating? You know, it depends on who you're listening to. Um, I don't know how much overlap there is between your audience and the audience of Fox News, for example. But if you're watching Fox News, you're probably getting bombarded with the message that this is an illegitimate proceeding. Um, it's not. The president placed his personal political interest over those of the country, and he ought to be brought to account for that. And certainly, you know, what's being said in the media influences the way senators might act on this. Um, how long do you think this could all take? It's anyone's guess. I imagine that both the uh, House, the Democrats, uh, and the Republicans in the Senate have sort of similar incentives to wrap it up pretty quickly. Um, so I would think it would probably take two weeks or less, but that's just a guess. And no one expects this to happen, but in the case of a conviction and a removal, and as you said, it needs two-thirds majority, what happens next? Well, the uh, uh, articles of impeachment specify that the president's not only removed from office, uh, but rendered ineligible to serve in any office of trust or profit under the United States uh, uh, for the rest of his life. So presumably, if in the very unlikely event that he were removed, he would also be disqualified. Uh, and then Vice President Pence would become president and, immediately. And that's immediately after the removal. That's, it's never happened in American history, but that's so our best not, understanding. We're not sure how that might go down. All right, David Franklin, thank you as always. Thanks. And there's more Chicago Tonight just ahead, so please stay with us. This evening's presentation of Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by ComEd, powering lives. We have a tremendous source of untapped, efficient energy right here in our school. Let her rip, Jenny. I kind of love this idea. <laughs> the ComEd Energy Efficiency Program has real ideas for making schools energy efficient. Pedal faster! CTA bus driver fired after hitting and running over a cyclist earlier this year had been working lots of overtime at the time of the crash, according to records obtained by WTTW News. And joining us with more is our own Nick Blumberg, who's been following this story for the last several months. For those not familiar with the crash, remind us what happened, Nick. Well, Paris, this started back on the morning of June 6th. A man named Joseph Morgan was riding his bike south on Wells Street, approaching Hubbard, when he was struck and run over by a CTA bus coming up to a stop. You can see the location of the bike lane and the bus stop in this animation. Morgan's attorney says he suffered major orthopedic and gastrointestinal injuries, including the need for a rerouted colon. The driver of the bus, Sunday Ajayi, was fired in July after a CTA investigation. This was his third on-the-job crash since January of 2018. 
Now, when we started looking into the crash, we found that Ajayi was among the CTA's highest paid bus drivers, which appeared to point to a lot of overtime pay. And according to agency records, as you said, obtained via a Freedom of Information Act request, that's exactly the case. At the time of the crash, this was a Thursday morning, the driver was already working extra hours. He'd been on the job for about two hours that day. He worked a total of six overtime hours that week. Now, from the beginning of 2019 until he was fired in July, Ajayi worked nearly 533 hours of overtime. So that works out to an average of about 60 hours a week on the job. Now, we asked the CTA if this much overtime is uncommon, if there are any safety concerns, and whether the agency is appropriately staffed. A statement from CTA Media Relations reads, in part, the safety of CTA riders and its employees is the top priority governing all CTA operations. CTA workplace rules ensure that bus operators have at least eight hours off between shifts in keeping with industry best practices. The statement goes on to say employees are not assigned overtime, indicating they choose to work extra hours and says the CTA is adequately staffed. And you said that this driver was highly paid, so just how highly? Well, the CTA pays for extra hours at the rate of time and a half. So Ajayi made the top of the scale for bus operators. That means his $35.36 an hour would become $53.04 for overtime pay. We don't yet have his exact pay for 2019, but in 2018, he earned more than $151,000. That was even higher than usual because he was owed some back pay. In 2017, he made nearly $118,000 and more than $114,000 in 2015. That's all well above the median salary for CTA bus drivers. Nick, you mentioned some of the consequences to the, uh, to the cyclists. What's been the fallout for the CTA so far here? Sure. So as we mentioned, the driver uh, was terminated by the CTA. Both the driver and the CTA are facing a lawsuit from the cyclist who was hit as well as another suit from someone who was rear-ended by this bus driver in a separate incident that also contributed to his firing. Those cases each have a hearing scheduled for next month. All right, Nick Blumberg, thank you very much. You're welcome. And now to Brandis Friedman and the story of rideshare giant Uber. Brandis. The ride-sharing company Uber burst onto the scene a decade ago, part of a dramatic reshaping of how many people get around. The story inside the company was just as dramatic. An aggressive CEO, an often toxic corporate culture, and an unwillingness to play by the rules when expanding into new cities. The new book, Super Pumped, The Battle for Uber, tells the story of the company's rise and the backlash that followed. And its author joins us now, Mike Isaac, technology reporter for the New York Times. Welcome to Chicago Tonight. Thanks for having me. So when did you first learn about Uber and what did you think of it way back then? Uh, funnily enough, it was 2010. It was uh, shortly after they had launched in 2009. I was living in San Francisco. I was uh, just starting to report on tech in the area. And weirdly, I had gone to school with their first intern who gave me a promo code when it was still called Uber Cab. And it was this crazy thing. It was basically a high-end service at that point and something that no one knew if it was going to work or not, right? Basically, you, the iPhone, if you remember, the smartphones were still kind of new and uh, pushing a button to get a car was uh, a kind of out there notion. So I got to see it early on and it was still a little bit working out the kinks and stuff, but uh, had no idea it would be become what it is today, basically. So the book's title, it comes from a list of corporate values uh, outlined by the founder that you spent a lot of time on the book, obviously, Travis Kalanick. And those corporate values, they read sort of like a frat guy version of Amazon's <laughs> corporate values. That's what right. are some of them and why is that? Yeah, so, uh, you know, in Silicon Valley, where I'm, I live in Reporta, uh, uh, you know, it's not just the normal, boring corporate platitudes of like what your company values are. I think everything is sort of amped up to the next level, right? For Amazon, which uh, Kalanick had been long obsessed with, they have a, a rule, uh, a list of 14 values themselves, which are basically like customer obsession and a, a lot of stuff that kind of show that they care about servicing customers. Travis's version of that was kind of <laughs> what you said, run through like a frat boy, bro speak translation engine. Uh, uh, a few of them were making magic, toe stepping, uh, meritocracy, uh, uh, be an owner, not a renter, which it's kind of hard to, yeah, 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 it's not, it's not very clear what all these means. But my favorite was um, Super Pumped, which uh, <laughs> the, their version of it was essentially 
how much, um, how pumped their employees were and how super pumped you were to come to your job and do your job well uh, was actually a point of evaluation for the company. And I start the book with a quote from Travis uh, talking about, you know, we bring our super pumpedness to everything in our job so we can keep essentially making magic internally. And he said this with almost no sense of self-awareness, I think. So it gives you kind of a, an idea of, of what the company's like. And super pumpedness is totally a real word, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, so his vision for aggressive growth, it also, it often meant pushing the boundaries, sometimes even breaking the law. How did that go unchecked? I mean, you, you know, in cities like Chicago, even like there were there were times where there were very strong tax unions or very strong local governments that were saying you can't push into. You remember back in 2014 and uh, 2012, and when the service was really getting its legs, there was still no framework around ride sharing. Now it's totally ubiquitous, but governments didn't know how to handle it, and there were no laws for how to treat, you know, uh, ride hailing apps. So Uber's um, way of dealing with that was to just barge into cities without really even asking permission. I think that's like a greater maxim in Silicon Valley, which is, you know, don't ask permission, ask forgiveness later, but we'll prove ourselves right by getting to a scale that people can't ignore because they'll love our product. And they did that. They, they did that in, in uh, they tried to do it in Chicago and they, they did it in Portland. They did it really in every major city in the U.S. and then slowly uh, to most cities around, or many cities around the world. And, you know, you can take issue with their methods, of which I, I do in a lot of their methods in this book, but you can also argue that maybe it worked, you know, like Uber's something that I use to get here today, or is that something that you might use on your, uh, on your phone to get home pretty frequently? So it's a debate, and it's still sort of, uh, it's still kind of the common belief in Silicon Valley, but, um, they, they also paid the price later for some of their more drastic actions. Right, and what kind of toll did that aggressiveness take on, on their drivers? So, I mean, I think the biggest complaint from the drivers was um, initially Uber, you know, paid a lot of money up front to get people to drive for the service. And whenever they moved into a new city, they, they had to attract drivers and be like, we'll pay you all these bonuses and, you know, you can uh, drive for us and make tons of money. Uh, and then, you know, over time, you just can't, uh, Uber found out quickly that you can't pay, pay drivers as much as they were paying for a long period of time. So the rates just shot down and drivers were, pay, were driving, uh, let's say, 40 hours for the amount it took them to, to make the same uh, amount of money that they used to drive 20 hours for, right? Their, their earnings were sort of cut in half. They were basically telling the company, we're, we feel like we're just, uh, we're chained to this company at this point and we, we don't really have... Uh, we don't have the, the fair wages that you promised us early on. And for most of Uber's lifespan, the, the company line was just ignore that and, and spout some economic theory at them to promise that eventually it earned, um, it, they would earn the same, but it never really worked that way. And the company also made some pretty strange hires, right? Like former NSA, CIA, and FBI hires. What yeah. they do? I mean, the crazy thing about Uber, you have to remember, they raised, I want to say, more than $10 billion in private capital. So imagine a CEO with unlimited money, uh, obsession with his competition, with Lyft uh, in the United States, with, with Grab in, in Southeast Asia, with Ola in India, and this idea that he's always got competitors coming to get him. So he essentially hired a secret uh, corporate espionage force of ex-FBI, CIA, NSA contractors who uh, basically would were hired and paid to spy on Uber's competitors and, and try to outwit them in any way they could. And some of it actually worked. In, in, in one scene in the book, they, uh, they sent, uh, this was more sadistic, I guess, they sent uh, Uber uh, operatives to take a photo of this uh, of one of his competitors at the moment that she found out Uber raised three billion dollars that <laughs> to get her reaction <laughs> when she knew that she was done for basically it was this weird sense of of he had to not only win the competition he had to crush his all of his competitors and that just describes Travis to a T. You also write about something called um, sort of founder worship that his behavior within the company went on for a while before it caught up to him. I think that's really a, a tech company thing too in, in California, in San Francisco especially. The idea that as a founder of a, of a tech company, as a founder of a startup, uh, you're the sort of know-all, see all-seeing, all-knowing uh, person that the troops have to lead or be led by. And I think that really started with the Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerbergs and Larry Pages and Jeff Bezos of the world. The idea that the founder can create 
uh, the next billion dollar app coding in his hoodie in his dorm room in, in, in Harvard or whatever, and, uh, and then grow that into a multi-billion dollar company. But I also think that, that this book at least tries to show the limits of that type of founder worship. And maybe if you follow the wrong founder, in this case, Travis, and someone who's willing to go way beyond just disruption or bending the rules, then you can perhaps end up with Department of Justice investigations or, or much worse. What was it that finally got Kalanick kicked out by his board? Honestly, it was um, 2017 was a nightmare year for the company. They had you know, I want to say scandal after scandal in the very first half of the year. There was multiple sexual harassment investigations. There were phys threats of physical violence. There were um, problems with HR. There were uh, software tools being used to evade law enforcement. So one after the other, their board, his board of, uh, of directors essentially said, this guy has to go. And then in a pretty dramatic fashion, they, they ousted him in a coup uh, here in Chicago, actually downtown. What's he doing now? <laughs> so he has decided to keep a low profile, which is probably a good idea since he was persona non grata for a while. Uh, he's working on a new startup called Virtual, uh, called uh, in, in the space, food delivery space, uh, with this idea called Virtual Kitchens or Ghost Kitchens. Uh, I think it's called Cloud Kitchens. The idea that you can create food for delivery apps in low cost warehouses uh, in Los Angeles and then uh, make money by renting those out to little virtual kitchens. It's, it's interesting, but his idea is to play at much lower profile right now so he doesn't attract the heat of the press for at least some time. He also came away with a decent amount of money. Oh yeah, he's the sort of cynical ending to a lot of this is he may have been ousted, he might have had very bad headlines, but he's also a multi-billionaire and continues to go to the Met Gala or, or <laughs> invest in companies alongside other blue chip firms and I don't know how much of a price he's paid so far. Um, not in actual money. <laughs> <laughs> um, so after his ouster, CEO uh, Dara Khazra Shahi came in. Has the company drastically changed? I think, I think a lot of folks who were problem, problem people, frankly, have, have kind of turned over in the company. A lot of people followed Travis out. They had their IPO earlier this year, which made a lot of new, uh, new millionaires, if not, uh, not 100,000 heirs. And, uh, and a lot of the real problematic people have, have left. That said, I mean, it's really hard to completely eliminate the DNA of a founder from the company, right? The, Travis ran Uber for close to 10 years and instilled a level of, of Travisness into Uber at this point. And it's really hard to, to change that. It just takes time. And it's been a little over two years since Dara uh, took over. And you know, they're, right now their big challenge is to prove to Wall Street that we can actually be a profitable company at some point. And that's, that's I think, going to be, uh, that's hard fought. But they're saying by 2021, they can hopefully turn a profit. And Travisness is a real word like super pumpedness, <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, that's in my corporate <laughs> values list. Mike Isaac, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Again, the new book from Mike Isaac is Super Pumped, The Battle for Uber. You can read an excerpt on our website. And there's more Chicago Tonight ahead. Don't go away. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight podcast and subscribe. For years, vintage toys have inspired a renowned Chicago artist. And recently, he shared his fun-filled collection with an extraordinary group of local artists. Carl Worsom is a painter. He was a key figure in the Harry Who, a wildly graphic group of artists who made their mark in Chicago and beyond in the 1960s. You've seen his work at the Art Institute, the MCA, and you might recall Plug Bug, a giant mural he painted on the Comet building in the Loop, now covered up by new construction. Carl Worsom is also a collector with an incredible toy box, and he loaned some of his toys to another creative collective. We recently stopped by for a visit. Here's another look at the artwork. The artists of Project Onward bring real skills and distinctive visions to the uncommon artwork they make. The studio gallery in the Bridgeport Art Center is a sanctuary for adult artists with developmental disabilities and mental disorders. When we visited, there was a table full of toys from generations ago. The toys came from the collection of the artist Carl Worsom, seen here on WTTW's Art Beat Show in 2004. His son, Zach Worsom, volunteers at Project Onward. Immediately when I walked through the door, the energy and sort of the creative uh, 
dynamic that was going on here was just infectious. Carl Worsom uses these toys as source material. The artist is now 80 years old and couldn't join us this day. His son explains his father's creative process. Collecting has been a huge part of his art practice and he kind of would go to you know thrift stores, Maxwell Street, uh, flea markets, swap meets, that kind of thing and you know collect uh, you know these tin toys and you know Halloween decorations, you know, sort of these various pieces of pop culture ephemera over the years. Zach Worsom is also an artist of note and these are his fun-filled paintings. We asked him about growing up in a house full of bizarre toys. There was a wealth of visual information at all times. Uh, as a child, it maybe wasn't always the most fun because there were all these wonderful things that I was not allowed to touch. So there was a little bit of museum situation going on where my dad had his toys and I had my toys. At Project Onward, the toy-inspired artwork is finished and ready for an opening. Some of the artists told us about the new work they're making. I was born in 58 and a lot of good movies horror movies came out around that time and uh, it helps me to poke fun but also celebrate that movie genre. A portrait of Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert. Actually this was commissioned by ComEd and they wanted celebrities from around Chicago. I'm working on a picture of Bubbly Creek which is a body of water from the Chicago River that runs behind Project Onward. And I'm doing a picture of Bubbly Creek back before it was polluted. Um, I've got frogs and turtles just kind of enjoying themselves. This is all to gender characters. This is all to gender poster that I've created. They always just work on their own. And then if they need help, we will give them some help, but we don't teach art. We provide the studio space as well as all the art materials for them to create art. And then when we sell the art for them, they get 50%. Many works go for between five and fifty dollars. Others, including collaborations with artists outside of Project Onward, sell for more. And their inspiration reaches beyond the studios in Bridgeport. I'm hooked. I'm, you know, uh, Project Onward for life. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. The 50 plus artists at Project Onward come from across Chicago and the suburbs. This Friday, December 20th, Project Onward will be open to the public for their annual holiday party. They're located at the Bridgeport Art Center and you can find out more on our website. And now Paris, back to you. Thanks Prentiss and now to Amanda Vinicky with a look at an up and coming literary genre. Amanda. What will the world look like in 20 years if climate change goes unchecked? That's the premise of 2040 A.D., a new collection of short stories published by McSweeney's Quarterly Concern in partnership with the Natural Resources Defense Council. Tackling droughts, wildfires, and more, the stories fall under an emerging literary genre known as climate fiction. Here to tell us more is Luis Alberto Orea, author of one of the stories in the collection and also a professor at the University of Illinois Chicago. Also, Rob Moore, director of the Water and Climate Team at the Natural Resources Defense Council, or NRDC. Thanks to each of you for joining us. Now, Luis, why choose 2040 as a time to write about? Uh, we were assigned. You um, have no choice, no, but, well, well, no. but why 2040? Well, um, it's the next marker point, right, in the, in the de-evolution of the world, in a sense. So we're at, we're at a certain point now, by 2040, the dial will have moved another 0.5, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and so they wanted to predict what the world might look like uh, when these changes have kicked in. And we were each paired with a climate expert or scientist who could coach us because though it's fiction, you don't want to say something that's outrageously off base. Um, Particularly I, at something that's as politically volatile and some for well, some people yeah, as climate change. Right. Now, Rob, talk to us more about that year 2040. There was an intergovernmental panel that cited that as the year. What is the science there? So the, the science behind that is uh, the International Panel on Climate Change uh, determined that uh, in, in, by the year 2040, we'll have reached kind of a point where we, uh, well, let me rephrase that. We need to reach a point by 2040 uh, where emissions are at a, 
uh, reduced so that we still have a chance of keeping warming to 1.5 degrees. Sort of 2040 is our goal line or else. Now, th these stories have been classified as something cl called climate fiction. <laughs> what is that as a genre? Uh, I, I think you always need some kind of a, of, a, of a marker, you know, some kind of a name, new and improved. Um, but Branding. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think so much climate fiction is rather dystopian and cautionary, almost prophetic, you know. Um, and my story, I think, is the only straight-up horror story in the, in the book. I didn't think of it as climate fiction, but I thought, you know, since we climate are... Climate horror. Climate horror, because that's what we're living. We just don't realize that we're in the middle of a bad dream. It's a nightmare. Um, and so I wanted to make it visceral rather than sort of theoretical or artful or, you know, cautionary. You, you really should recycle. <laughs> you know, I wanted people to understand that there's something really awful coming for us. And so your story, it's called The Night Drinker. Yeah. It brings us to Mexico City in the year 2040. So really not all that far from now. No, it's not. Give us an overview of what North America, the, the, the North America that you envision looks like. <laughs> um, overrun with climate refugees. That's happening now. We're not recognizing it, but it's happening now. You know, if you go to Tijuana, where I was born, it's full of Haitians. It's full of Eritreans. There are Cubans there. You know, there are people from all over the world just trying to get close to our border, not necessarily cross it. Um, and so Driven in Driven by climate change. A lot of them, yes. Uh, it, the Honduran people say who are coming, who are, yes, avoiding violence, but they're also avoiding a drought. They're avoiding famine, which is looming over much of Central America because of climate. So the, the story actually came from my going down to the Celaya area uh, in the middle of, of the country on the western side, and they're dealing with these waves of migrants, these waves of refugees, and what's going to happen to them when the seas rise, what's going to happen to them by 2040 if these things we predict happen, which I suspect are happening quicker than they say. So a deluge of migrants, of drought, of famine, of sea fire, seawater rising. Sea rising. Yeah. Again, as, as you noted, every author was paired with a scientist from the NRDC. Tell us more about that process, Rob. Yeah, it was, it was a really fun process to be part of. Uh, our role at NRDC wasn't to fact check um, what the writers were wanting to express in their stories. It was to provide, it was really to be a resource and to kind of support each author's own creative process, uh, where they wanted to ground something in uh, a plausible uh, scenario from a climate science standpoint, um, we were there to help them figure out what that would look like. If they wanted, if there was a, a plot twist that they wanted to explore, hmm. we wanted to be able to help them understand: is that something that that the science supports? Um, so it was really it was it was a great way for those of us in NRDC that work on these issues day in, day out. It was, it was kind of a nice, uh, it was a new way of kind of approaching some of these. Versus a research paper or something. Yeah, versus a research <laughs> or an advocacy or a policy analysis. It was actually really, uh, I think it challenged us, many of us at NRDC in ways that we probably were, didn't expect to be challenged. In a sense, really the climate fiction can maybe do something that a documentary yeah. couldn't do. Exactly. But at no point were we ever thinking, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna read these before they're published. We wanna make sure right. they're uh, scientifically sound. That wasn't, that wasn't our role. Our role was to be there to help authors understand the science behind climate change, potential implications that we've been already dealing with and that we'll continue to deal with in the future. Unless really something just, changes. <laughs> unless something changes radically. You do write that the degradation of the planet is a, quote, eroding of the human mind. Yes. What do you mean by that? Um, because it's really difficult to think great thoughts and to compose great symphonies and to, you know, plan ahead when you're getting more and more desperate and you're trying to save your child or your life and um, panic sets in. And I think, you know, some of the, uh, some of the physical outcome of this experience is, uh, as we're seeing uh, in a lot of the world, hunger, thirst, violence. A, a panicked journey across inhospitable lands. So your your focus of of uh, 
how should I put this, soul largeness shrinks. You're just trying to get to the next shelter and you're hoping to find a little water and you're hoping to avoid bad characters on the road. And we only have really about 10 seconds left, so good luck tackling this, but some would say panic has not set in yet, at least for political leaders. Is there any optimism for either of you? Oh, Lord. Well, Rob I would, will fix it. I, I would say there's definitely cause for optimism. Yeah. Most of the challenges we face in addressing the causes of climate change are not within our technical, um, they're, they're, we're not limited in a technical sense. Uh, the solutions are all here before us. It's a matter of mustering the will to actually employ them. I think on the on dealing with the climate and, impact side, um, you know, those are also going to be tough choices in helping people cope with the, the very real challenges of climate change. But again, we're we're equipped to deal with them. The question is not if, it's really? are we will we actually do it? That's exactly right. And this collection explores those very topics. Thanks so much to each of you for joining us here on Chicago Thank tonight. You. Again, 2040 AD is published by McSweeney's in partnership with the NRDC. Now, Paris, back to you. Thanks, Amanda. And that's our show for this Tuesday night. Please join us tomorrow night live at 7. Now, for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Paris Schutz. I thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning is made possible in part by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, wishing all a happy and healthy holiday season.